Some of you may remember last week I made a video on a tool called Scython, which aims to speed up Python code by, you know, uh, reliably anywhere between about 20 and 50 times. In rare cases, it can be, you know, 100 times faster, 200 times faster even, um, in, you know, some exceptional circumstances. And today we're going to be looking at a tool called Number, which aims to do pretty much the same thing. However, it's kind of exists in a different domain to Scython. It has different use cases. It works you know, very differently. Whereas Scython is a more general, um, you know, application, Number is, well, as the name kind of implies, uh, a lot more suited or a lot more limited to numerical operations. So it works, you know, very well with NumPy, it works uh, very well with your know, standard mathematical operations. Uh, it claims to run on a, or to help speed up a subset of Python code. That subset is perhaps a little bit more limited than I would like, but I'll talk about that near the end of the video. But whereas Scython relies on, you know, writing a program in a specific syntax and then, you know, transpiling it and then compiling it into, you know, a C library that you can import, number is a lot easier to use at the offset. You know, it is a single generator, oh no, a single decorator, sorry, I'm getting my terms confused, uh, which acts as a just-in-time compiler. So this just-in-time compiler, for those of you that don't know, is essentially halfway between an interpreter and a compiler. It compiles code at runtime, so you get the compiled speeds, but you do have a little bit of overhead while it actually compiles it because it compiles it when it needs it, it doesn't compile it beforehand. Hence it compiles it just in time, hence the name just in time compiler, which I'm gonna be referring to as a JIT here on because that's generally what people do. And this JIT decorator is ultimately what speeds um, your Python code up. Now I'm gonna be showing you two examples in today's video. The first of which is you know a situation where number uh, can help speed up the code quite a lot. And the second of which is a situation where it can't really do an awful lot. From what I can tell in testing, numbers strengths seem to rely on numerical operations that are called a lot in an execution cycle. So if you have an algorithm that calls, you know, a specific function, and we'll, you know, we'll be going into examples of it. But if you have a, a, you know, an algorithm that calls a specific function a lot of times, and I mean a lot of times, then that's, you know, just in time compilation will really help because you get, you know, the speed ups each and every time you run it and those, you know, add up. But if you're just calling something once, for example, then the overhead of the just in time compilation is probably not going to make the whole thing a lot quicker. It could even make it slower in the long run, potentially. Before we jump in with either of those examples, though, we need to actually install the thing. It's no different from installing anything else. You could just do pip install number and we get version 0.55.2 in uh, in my case. And that also installs NumPy, Setup Tools and LLVM Lite. Uh, as well. And now we have all that installed, I'm going to show you the first example. So we're going to go into this file here. This is a k-means clustering algorithm. For those of you that don't know what it does, very briefly, it helps detect patterns in data sets where classification isn't really an option. It's mainly for regression problems, and I believe it's useful when you're using unsupervised data. I can never bloody remember whether it's supervised or unsupervised data. I believe it's unsupervised regression data you would ideally want to use clustering on to find patterns and stuff. And this is an algorithm that's used quite a lot. It's actually used in Im image segmentation as well. I don't know the, the, you know, the details about that. Image processing is not really my thing. Uh, you don't really need to understand the code to, to know what I'm doing. As I say, we're only working with some decorators here. But we have this k-means pp, which stands for k-means plus plus, which is a variant of k-means clustering. And then you have these three functions up here. Now these are the three kind of of interest because these are the three we're going to be decorating with the comp with, with the uh, with the number jit. I'll explain why we can't decorate this near the end of the video, but I just want to get into the functionality first. So in order to decorate it, all we have to do is do import number as nb. And then we can provide either nb.jit, which is our, you know, nb uh, uh, just-in-time compiler, or nb.njit, which is the same as providing a no Python equals true keyword argument to the JIT decorator. And it removes a reliance on Python objects. Now, obviously, the NJIT isn't going to work for everything. I believe NumPy stuff and mathematical stuff, it works fine. You can JIT other code as well, and you know you might get a speed up out of it. But the NJIT is generally faster than JIT. You just can't use it absolutely everywhere, um, which is understandable. I would say it's annoying, but it is perfectly understandable, to be honest. Uh, but we're just going to be using the NJITs for these three functions here. And that's basically it. 
you know, that's all we really need to do. Our K-means clustering algorithm is now a lot quicker. And to demonstrate that, I'm actually going to remove it uh, because down at the bottom of the code, I've got some benchmarking stuff. Now, I did a video on time it last time out. We're not actually going to be using time it in this video. Now, one kind of problem with K-means clustering is that the actual number of clusters or the K value is not always clear, you know, and the only way to find it out is basically to brute force it. So you would run your K-means clustering on say two clusters, then three clusters and four clusters, and five clusters and six clusters. And then you would compare the data and then you would select, you know, the best K value from there. But as I say, in order to do that, we need to run, you know, the K-means clustering algorithm over and over and over again. So in this example, I've got a max K of 20. So we're gonna go between two and 20 clusters and we're gonna do clustering each and every time. And if I run this, so it'd be k-means.py. Okay, so there we go, the raw Python implementation has completed. That operation took 90 seconds, so a minute and 30 seconds. I'm gonna go now and decorate, well, I'm gonna re-add uh, all of these back. And we're gonna run this again and see just how much faster it is. And as you can see, we're back already. It's a lot quicker. It's now four seconds. If we load the calculator, we can do 90 divided by four, and we get a 22.5 times speed up. And the reason this is, is that uh, this distance function, this softmax function, and this closest centroid function are being called a lot. You know, these are being called you know, multiple times every single iteration, and there are a lot of iterations here. And because we're running the k-means, you know, clustering algorithm multiple times, uh, you know, that helps, you know, that just kind of builds on the speed ups even more, and then you end up with this you know, kind of huge speed up off you know three lines of code and basically no knowledge of what's going on whatsoever potentially and this is kind of the thing that i like most about number the fact that you could just throw this on a function and try it you've got nothing to lose it's not like you're you know it's not like it's going to take a million years it's literally just a line of code and your and your you know function could potentially be orders of magnitude faster than it was before so there really is no harm if you have anything mathematical and just throwing this decorator on a function or a method and just seeing if it makes it any quicker but as much as number is very nice and very convenient obviously that comes with some costs as well. You know, Scython had its benefits and costs as well. Scython's speed and versatility um, was met with its, you know, inconvenience of having to rewrite, you know, a significant portions of the code. Number, speed, and convenience comes with a cost of, you know, versatility. There's some weird things that it's not capable of doing. And that's in part what I'm gonna be showing you with this second example. So in the second example here, we have a, uh, a polynomial regression function here. This is just you know a manual implementation. For anyone that was ever curious about a manual imp implementation, this is what it looks like. We also have the same thing that's been engitted, as I'm gonna call it. And we have some random values uh, and we are tasked with, you know, it's, it's the same sort of thing as we'd have with the k-means algorithm. You know, we have a, a varying numbers of degrees of polynomial regression. And we're just kind of, you know, for every degree in two to 20, uh, calculating the polynomial regression to that degree. And then, uh, you know, working out the times and everything. This one is a little bit more fancy. We have, you know, like a proper output and everything because it's a little bit easy to put together. But if we just kind of run this, we'll see that for, you know, two to, t actually it is one as well, for one to 20 degrees, the pure Python implementation takes 7.6 seconds and the number implementation, it should come back any second now. Takes 16.7 seconds, so number in this case is actually slower. And the reason for that is purely because of the overheads with the just-in-time compilation. You know, this function is not being run enough times to you know, compensate for the initial overhead. So there is a minimum amount of time that number, you know, ngitted functions can run in. Uh, because it has to compile everything first. And this is why, you know, the more things are run, you know, the more speed up you actually get because you are compensating more and more for the initial overhead that you had when you were compiling, uh, you know, the function or the method in the first place. Now, really, in the long run, this isn't a particularly big issue. You know, as I said, you could just bolt a decorator on and see if it makes it any quicker. If it does, great. If it doesn't, then hopefully your implementation is quick. You know, this polynomial regression implementation is very fast because it uses NumPy pretty much exclusively. 
Uh, but the issue I have with Numba that's a bit more serious is the limited usability of it. Um, and the fact that some things that you really should be able to do with Numba just can't be done. So, for example, if you wanted to use math.factorial, you can't do that at all. If you have a number function that uses math.factorial, it will error um, if you use the JIT or the NJIT, I believe. Now, other things that I noticed during testing, this is kind of the reason why we couldn't NJIT this. Uh, this, where is it? The, oh, I've lost it now. Oh yeah, this uh, mean, mp.mean down here. You can run mp.mean using number unless you do it across an axis, which is necessary for k-means clustering, or at least how I've implemented it. Um, so if you want to do a mean across an axis, then unfortunately you can't do that using number. It won't let you. Another thing it won't let you do, um, which is kind of necessary for k-means plus plus, um, I mean, there is a bit of a workaround for this, but you can't do, uh, you can't select a random element from an array based on a weighted probability distribution. Number will just go, no, you can't do that. You know, the P keyword, and, it, and it's the P keyword argument doesn't exist, and the axis keyword argument doesn't exist. And that's because they have their own, like, custom, more jittable implementations of things and they haven't re-added everything that NumPy can do. Now I understand that NumPy is a huge library uh, with a lot of stuff in it, but these things to me seem quite important, to be honest. Uh, you know, being able to mean across an axis and being able to choose based on a random probability distribution, this isn't uncommon, you know, this happens a lot um, in numerical processing, stuff like this. And also the math.factorial thing is super weird. I have no idea why that's not supported. So yeah, it's worth keeping in mind that while number can make things very quick, it can't really do everything you'd think it would be able to do. With that being said, it's not all doom and gloom. You know, I haven't even touched on some things that number is capable of doing, like this automatic parallelization with at JIT and the at NJIT works with this as well. Uh, I'm not gonna show any examples. I haven't really messed around with this uh, too much. But number does provide interfaces for, you know, well, automatic parallelization. So you have this NJIT, you can pass parallel equals true. And then you can also bring in this P range. And this P range is essentially like a parallel loop. So essentially when this is all JIT compiled, it will, I don't, I don't know how it works under the hood, but it will just parallelize itself and it will, you know, you'll get huge speed ups because, you know, parallelized code, Python has a huge issue with that. You know, it's not easy to parallelize code in Python at all. And the ability to just do it so easily in number is really nice. You know, the huge benefit of it, you know, say you're trying to, you know, sum a list of a million values. If you're going to do it, you know, one by one, that's going to take quite a while. But if you can split that across 10 separate threads or 10 separate cores, then you can sum up each individual core and you can sum up, you know, kind of the, the final results. And you end up with a system that's already about 10 times faster. And if you think about that on top of the speed benefits that number already provides, then you're looking at some potentially very, very big numbers. The other thing number has built in is support for NVIDIA CUDA. Now, I don't really know anything about this. I did a university module where we had to use OpenCL for NVIDIA CUDA and I hated it. It was awful. Uh, I have been scared away from NVIDIA CUDA probably forever, honestly. Uh, so I can't really help you with this. But I just wanted to let you know that this was something that you could do because I know, you know, there are a lot of people that would be interested uh, in functionality like this. So if you are interested in, you know, uh, doing uh, NVIDIA CUDA operations, you know, mathematical NVIDIA CUDA operations, the number has, you know, an interface to do it for you and probably abstracts a lot of the difficult stuff away from you, honestly. Um, but yeah, this is just something really cool if you're interested in that. But yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about in this video. If you liked it, let me know by hitting the like button and maybe hit the subscribe button as well if you really enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or anything, then feel free to leave them in the comments below. If you have any suggestions on what you want to see on this channel next, then leave them down there as well. I'm always open for ideas, so hit me with them. If you want to go one step further in supporting the channel, you can either become a member using the join button below, or scroll down a little further into the description uh, to pledge on the Patreon. One pound a month on either, and you can be on this screen like these people. And I will see you in the next video where we tackle my C. Um, it's kind of more Scython-esque in the way it works, but there are differences uh, in, in how it operates. So if you're interested in that, then I would recommend uh, checking that out. So I'll see you for that.